All right, so uh, today I'm here to talk to you about America's founding monsters, Ice Age animals, and the birth of America. I'm Dr. Bernard K. Means of the Virtual Creation Laboratory at Virginia Commonwealth University. And I'm going to talk very briefly about the lab. Uh, so the lab, uh, um, uh, which I run, uh, we travel around uh, the world, uh, mostly the United States, but also India. And we do some 3D scanning of uh, items of historical interest, uh, archaeological discoveries, and the fossils of uh, animals, both large and small. Um, I've been to Ohio to scan an Egyptian mummy sarcophagus, and I've been to India uh, more times than I've been to Ohio to 3D scan the statues of gods and goddesses. Most of the work that we do is uh, actually on campus. Uh, the laboratory is on campus. And the work is done primarily by VCU students, mostly undergraduates in anthropology, some history students, and some students from the School of the Arts. Uh, so we do 3D scanning in the lab, we do 3D printing, and we paint the replicas. Uh, we work with museums to create items uh, that are used for research, teaching, uh, and outreach, including museum exhibits. And one of the exhibits that we uh, worked on is actually in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center, uh, where you can see some of these 3D printed items on exhibit. And I bring up Philadelphia because I want to talk about uh, one of the things I scanned in Philadelphia. Uh, just a little over a year ago, uh, just right before COVID hit, and in fact, uh, the museum that I was doing the 3D scanning in uh, shut down as I was scanning, scanning items, but I was able to scan this one item in particular. And what I have here is a 3D print of a claw uh, that I 3D scanned a little over a year ago in Philadelphia, and it belonged to Thomas Jefferson. So in the late 1700s, Thomas Jefferson was mailed a number of bones from the hand of a mysterious giant beast, and also some of the arm bones as well. And Thomas Jefferson was really interested and really fascinated in getting this claw. And you might say, why would Thomas Jefferson care about uh, the bones of an animal that clearly did not exist anywhere that uh, um, Jefferson or anybody else had seen in recent times? The reason for this was because in 1755, one of the leading intellectuals in Europe, a Frenchman by the name of Comte Buffon, wrote a theory that came, that came to be known as a theory of American degeneracy. And Comte Buffon and then people who followed after him argued that the very physical land that the Americas were on caused anybody who went there to become smaller and weaker and more effeminate, and it affected the uh, crops that they raised, it affected their livestock, everything became tainted. Not only that, Comte de Buffon argued that there had never been anything in the Americas for any time period that was bigger than something seen in the old world. Um, and so Jefferson thought this claw is great, right? So this claw is gonna be able to help me uh, tell my story. I'm gonna be able to disprove Comte de Buffon. And Jefferson, um, was working on a paper he actually presented in Philadelphia in the late 1700s, and he called the beast that this claw belonged to Megalonyx, which means great claw. And he compared the claw of Megalonyx to the claw of an African lion. And so I have a 3D printed replica of an African lion claw in my right hand. Um, and you can see that this claw is much bigger. And so in Jefferson's mind, this must have been a tremendous, giant clawed animal. Now, Jefferson was about to publish this paper about this giant cat that roamed the Americas and probably terrorized every living creature, uh, when somebody showed him a paper from South America and pointed out that this was actually a claw of a giant ground sloth. Now, you may have heard of sloths uh, uh, today. They're small animals. They're slow moving. Uh, they climb in trees. Well, a giant ground sloth is a relative of those sloths that live today. But they were big. They stood over 10 feet tall. I actually have a 3D printed replica of a giant ground sloth, and then I 3D printed my lab manager, Mason Smith, at the same scale. So you can see Mason, who's five foot five inches, is much smaller <laughs> than a giant ground sloth. So this didn't work for Jefferson. Jefferson, it, giant ground sloths were big, but they weren't fierce, they weren't meat eaters. They wanted something that was a meat eater. 
Um, there's a little bit of a segue in here. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, well, you know, we're looking for the fossils of something big that's going to prove that we had big things in the Americas. But he knew of one big animal um, that was as big or bigger than anything in Europe, at least, and that was the moose. And so Thomas Jefferson put a call out to all of his friends and said, find me a moose. And finally, somebody finds him a moose and they drag it through the woods. And by that time they get it to some place where they're gonna send it to Jefferson, the moose's antlers have fallen off. And they send Jefferson this sort of decaying moose carcass with a bunch of antlers. They said, well, these are just as good. Uh, Jefferson couldn't do much better. So he decided to send the uh, moose carcass to France and it arrived to the Comte de Buffon's house. But we have no idea what Buffon thought of the moose carcass. He died a month after he got it. So the moose carcass didn't really work out for, uh, for Jefferson. Uh, the claw, the giant ground sloth didn't really work out for Jefferson. Didn't work out for any of the founding fathers. What can we do? Well, in the early 1700s uh, in New York, uh, people began to find teeth that kind of look like this. Uh, they're big, um, they're clearly of some sort of large creature. They originally interpreted to be the teeth of biblical giants. Uh, so people thought that there were giant humans in the old days because they read about that in the Bible. So they thought these were giant teeth and they kind of look like molars and they, they are in fact molars. A couple of decades into the uh, uh, 1700s on a plantation in South Carolina, some more of these large teeth are found. Um, and they are also by the plantation owner called to be the teeth of a giant. Uh, but this plantation over had people enslaved that he had, had in purchased that were enslaved from Africa. And those enslaved Africans go, that's not a giant's tooth. That's an elephant tooth. And it would have looked like this. This is a, from a baby uh, mammoth. And so the teeth that were found in that South Carolina plantation from the description must have been mammoth teeth. And mammoths are a close relative or were a close relative of today's elephants. And like today's elephants, they ate grasses. So clearly America's had a big animal, but again, like the giant ground sloth, these are plant eaters. And so people were on the quest to find something big and something that was fierce and something that was uh, basically masculine. Um, and in Kentucky, there's a site called Big Bone Lick, which has big bones at it. And it's a site that American Indians had known about for generations. Uh, they directed explore, uh, European explorers there. People were fascinated by these bones of giant animals and they shipped back hundreds of pounds of these bones, first to the East Coast, and then some of them made it their way over to Europe. Everybody was interested in these giant bones. One of these bones, um, and this is actually what started my research, is this. Uh, this is a tooth. Uh, this uh, uh, was found in property that belonged to Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia. And we recognize today that this is the tooth of a mastodon. And so people, were, people saw these teeth. Uh, they saw that they were different than the, the elephant teeth uh, that had been found earlier, the mammoth teeth. Um, must be from a giant fierce creature. But straight teeth weren't really enough. Right? Stray teeth weren't enough to tell the story. The quest was on to find a complete skeleton. And in the very late 1700s, as the century is ending, um, a farmer hits bones on his property in New York State. And this makes the newspapers. And artist Charles Wilson Peale, who was a friend of, of Jefferson and a friend of Franklin and a friend of Washington, um, he's running a museum at this time in Philadelphia, and he decides he's going to go up to New York and he's going to get a mastodon skeleton, or what we now know as a mastodon. Uh, so he goes up there, uh, he pays the farmer for the bones uh, that the farmer's already found. He constructs this big wooden wheel, and, it's, and he, uh, he uses it, he's partly a showman. Right? So he's a, a museum person. He's partly a showman and he has people run inside of the wheel, kind of like it's a giant hamster wheel. And they're powering buckets that are taking water out of the excavations they're doing because the excavations are filling in as quickly as they dig and as quickly as they're pulling these bones out. 
And this uh, excavation, which happened in 1801, was the first scientific excavation done by what was the recent, recently became the United States. Um, so uh, Peel got these bones. He actually dug at some other sites. And he got the bones of more than one uh, mastodon. And he takes them back uh, to Philadelphia. Um, and he works with his uh, sons, Rembrandt and Rubin. Uh, Charles Wilson Peel was a big uh, a uh, fan of these uh, many artists, and he named his children after famous artists. Uh, so he has sons Rembrandt and, uh, and Reuben uh, uh, unpack these bones. Uh, Charles Wilson Peale has an enslaved servant named Moses Williams uh, who helps uh, put together these bones. And in fact, Peale actually credits uh, um, uh, Wilson uh, um, uh, Williams with, with doing this, uh, uh, with helping reconstruct the Macedon. Um, and, and they also have to carve some of the bones out of wood. They're missing bones. Uh, so uh, Moses Williams, uh, Rembrandt, or, uh, um, Charles Wilson Peel's sons, uh, artist William Rush, they carve these wooden bones. And I have a, a replica here. This is actually in Baltimore now. Uh, this is a Macedon tailbone that was carved out of wood and was used to reconstruct one of the Macedon skeletons. And they have a big opening uh, on Christmas Eve, 1801. They reveal uh, this large animal, uh, the Macedon, to the American people. At the time, it was still called a mammoth because we use the term kind of generically, uh, but it caused a mammoth craze. Everybody was fascinated. This was finally the animal to prove that we had something really big in the Americas. And at the time, uh, people were convinced that Macedons were meat eaters. Uh, they were soon disproved, uh, but we did have this big animal. Um, you can see these animals uh, today, hopefully as museums open up again, you'll be able to see these, uh, these animals. Uh, I'm, uh, um, one of the things I was able to do when I was in New York uh, was 3D scan one of these uh, Macedons, and I had to get up on a, on a high ladder to do it. And I'm, I'm carefully sort of balancing myself so I don't fall off the ladder away from the Mastodon or fall into the Mastodon. Um, but we have these Mastodons now, um, and they gave proof that the theory of degeneracy is one that didn't really work. And kind of the last thing I'm going to sort of mention um, ties in Thomas Jefferson with one of his other sort of great accomplishments, and that was sending Lewis and Clark to the Louisiana Purchase. And Jefferson was not a believer in extinction, and so he asked... Lewis and Clark to find him some living Macedons and living giant ground sloths because he assumed they had to be somewhere out west. Uh, but they died out about 10,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. And so today, if you want to go see them, I recommend you go to uh, a museum near you. Thank you.